Hey, y'all. So we're back. We're going to keep on going with this chapter 12, and hopefully we're going to finish this up um, not as long as it took the last time. Um, I thought that last one would take about 30 minutes, and it took an hour. So sorry about that. But hopefully this one will only take about an hour um, or so. So let's get focused on this, and let's get moving. This is just kind of the second part of that presentation. So first off, let's hit a little bit of a review. Don't forget nervous system is one of the body's two main control systems along with endocrine. Nervous is fast, endocrine is slow um, to, to react. Nervous system goes away quickly, its actions go away quickly, but endocrine lasts a long time. As we mentioned, reproduction versus getting yourself out of the middle of the street with a car coming. Um, so these, this nervous system is going to use those electrical activities, and that's really what we're going to focus on today, is how do we make that electricity, and how do we use that to create um, the whole functioning nervous system. <clears throat> When we look, don't forget our basic five steps. So we have a stimulus that's going to trigger a receptor. So the first step that we mentioned last time was the receptor. And so receptors are specialized cells that can detect a stimulus or detect a change in conditions. These guys are going to collect that sensory information. Then we're going to send sensory in. And sensory goes into the central nervous system. The central nervous system's focus is on processing and evaluating the information. Don't don't forget that the interneurons, the connection is what forms the circuit board, and that really processes that sensory that comes in and determines the response that's needed if there is one that's required. And there it's going to initiate the response. So then it's going to send out that response on the motor um, system, so the motor neurons, and the motor neurons are then going to hit the effectors. Remember, the effectors are the actual structures that are going to make the change, they're going to bring us back to balance and actually make the change that fix the situation. Generally, we talk about muscles, and we talk about organs slash glands as the two main effectors. Again, here's a little brief overview of central versus peripheral. Don't forget central nervous system versus peripheral nervous system. Central is the brain and the spinal cord. Anything outside of that is considered the peripheral nervous system. So in the PNS, we tend to talk about nerves and ganglia. So... The central nervous system, don't forget, is what does the processing and the evaluating, the actual thinking. And then the um, peripheral nervous system is what's bringing the information in, sensory in, and what's taking the decision out, motor out. Again, when we divide the nervous system, especially the peripheral nervous system, we start to talk about how it has sensory coming in, and again, that word afferent means incoming. So sensory is bringing information in, new information, changes in information into the central nervous system. We have somatic sensory that tells us about what we consciously perceive or, or, or excuse me, or about our main senses. So things like your eyes and your, you know, so sight and smell and sound and taste and, and uh, touch. And so these are really our main somatic sensory. So really, really kind of telling us about the outside environment versus visceral sensory. Visceral, of course, refers to organs. So this is going to tell us about what our organs are doing inside of our body. And this is stuff that we don't really pay attention to. We don't consciously perceive this. So the visceral sensory kind of tells us about blood pressure and the conditions inside our body. And somatic sensory tells us about the outside. Then we have the motor division. Don't forget motor nervous system is also referred to as the efferent or efferent nervous system. That refers to outgoing. Motor is what takes the command, the decision that the central nervous system made, and it takes it out to the effectors, to the actual structures that are going to make the changes. Now, when we talk about the motor division, we also, the motor nervous system, also have two divisions of that. We have the somatic motor, and somatic motor is going to move us around in our outside environment. So what that really controls is our skeletal muscles. Okay, so it controls those muscles that we learn, and we really focused on that somatic motor uh, division whenever we were in chapter 10 looking at muscles, skeletal muscles. The visceral motor system is also referred to as the autonomic nervous system, and that's usually what you'll hear it called is autonomic more than visceral. But I still like for you to know that it's called the visceral motor system because that tells you that we're going to control the organs. We're not going to control the muscles. We're instead, we're going to control organs mainly and some of the involuntary, the cardiac and the smooth muscle as well as glands and organs. Control the insides to make sure that they're doing the right thing. 
Here again is that, that figure that we saw in our last presentation. You're more than welcome to review this. This is a great image to keep some things straight in your noggin. Now let's start with new information. New information today begins with synapses. We have two main forms of synapses, but don't forget a synapse is a connection between a neuron and another cell. It may be a neuron and another neuron to keep the pathway going, or it may be at the end of the whole cycle we have a neuron synapsing with an effector with our muscles or our glands. There are two types of synapses. We have electrical synapses and we have chemical synapses. What we talked about in the muscular system were chemical synapses. We used neurotransmitters. So in a chemical synapse, we're going to use a neurotransmitter. Specifically in the muscles, we used acetylcholine. And I mentioned that's a major neurotransmitter in our body. Electrical synapses, these are very rare. And let's go ahead and let's just talk about those and get them out of the way. I want you to realize the focus in this presentation is on chemical, not electrical. So let's go ahead and talk about electrical real quick. Electrical synapses are very rare. This is when we have neurons that are physically bound together. We can have other cells physically bound together, spreading APs, and they act like electrical synapses. The whole key is they're connected with tunnels. They're connected with gap junctions, and this gap junction allows the inside of the cells to be shared, and so there's absolutely no delay in passing that electrical signal. Because they're all connected, if one experiences it, they, all of them that are connected experience it at the same time. Now, it's not exactly an electrical synapse, but it's a very, very similar, extremely similar. And it's going to act the exact same way, the intercalated disc in those cardiac muscle cells. Remember we talked about that, the connection between those muscle cells is going to allow them to um, pass that stimulation so they all act as one big unit instead of um, kind of contracting in little waves. Chemical synapses are the most common, and that's what our focus for today's lecture is going to be on, is a chemical synapse. Now, the chemical synapse is where we're going to use <clears throat> that neurotransmitter, and we're going to use that chemical. We're going to pass it from one synaptic knob out to the dendrite or cell body <clears throat> excuse me, of the other neuron or you know, it could be an effector. Um, and don't forget that space in between. I like to call it a synapse, but it's properly called the synaptic cleft. So we're going to have a presynaptic neuron. We always have to have a presynaptic neuron because if not, we don't have a synapse. So the neuron before the synapse is called presynaptic. The cell after it, I use the term target cell, but I'll also use the word postsynaptic cell. It doesn't always have to be a neuron. As I mentioned, the postsynaptic cells, if it's a neuron, then we're keeping that signal passing along a pathway. But if it, it could be um, a muscle or a organ or gland, and so the postsynaptic cell could just be our effector. So here it does have to be a postsynaptic neuron. Um, sometimes it is, many times it is to keep it going, but at the very end of the process, it can be attached to a postsynaptic cell, and that would be our target cell. So that would be that muscle or that gland. Now, don't forget, we're going to use a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is a chemical message that is going to create a new action potential in a target cell. Again, a, a neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger, and it is going to create a new AP in a target cell by binding on that target cell. If we get enough neurotransmitter release and enough binding on our target cell, on our postsynaptic cell, then we're going to create a new postsynaptic potential. So we're going to create a new action potential on our target cell. So the action potential can't be passed, and this is really the key. We can't simply hand off an action potential because we're not touching each other. If we were touching, we could hand it off, but because we're not, we have to create a new action potential in our target cell. And that's the entire job of this neurotransmitter. It's passed from one cell to the other because you can't pass the AP, and there it allows that target cell to create its own action potential. Now, in order to talk about all of this action potential, we have to begin with transmembrane potential. And this is kind of what we talked about under muscular system under chapter 10, and also we talked about it in the last chapter 12 presentation that hopefully you just finished watching. Transmembrane potential literally means across the membrane there is a type of potential energy. There's a type of energy. And so the whole key, transmembrane potential, is the result of separating ions. It is due to an uneven distribution 
of ions across a cell membrane. So this transmembrane potential is created by separating ions and then when we create we separate ions it creates this electricity in between those ions so if we separate ions don't forget an ion is a minus charged atom and so if we separate these ions by separating plus and minus ions on different sides of the cell membrane that's how we get the term transmembrane across the membrane so we separate the pluses and the minuses more pluses outside more minuses inside now we've got a difference we've got an electrochemical gradient and what we've just created is an electrical energy that's called transmembrane potential now this transmembrane potential it is an electrical impulse it is a little zap of lightning almost it's like a little static zap that you, when you walk along the floor and with in your socks then you zap your your brother or sister or whoever so it's the exact same kind of thing except for just you're being the outside and they're being the inside of the cell and you're seeing the zap go across the membrane whenever you see that little zap of electricity so transmembrane potential it is an electrical charge across the membrane but what really is important right now is that if a cell exhibits transmembrane potential, that cell has the ability to be stimulated and then to conduct that stimulation down itself, down its membrane. And so what we're saying here, we're going to create electricity on the membrane. The action potential is on the membrane of this neuron. And as long as we can create transmembrane potential, as long as we can separate ions, then now that cell, can exhibit this excitability and conductability. Okay, and those were two of those um, characteristics that we talked about. So first off, transmembrane gives the cell the ability to be stimulated. Okay, and then past that. In order to separate ions, in order to get these ions, these plus and minus charged ions in different places, we're going to have to use a couple of things. We're going to first have to use something called a pump. So what we're really looking at is called the sodium potassium pump. The pump uses energy. Think about it. If you're going to pump up a tire, then it's going to take energy from you to push that pump. And then the what you're really doing is building up radiant. You're not going from high to low. You're trying to put more air where there's already more air inside that tire. So you're going from not uphill to downhill. You're going from downhill to uphill. And so pumps, they cost ATP. And what it does is it builds up gradients. So it builds up concentrations. And these pumps are actually kind of like um, revolving doors because we're going to have something called the sodium potassium pump. This revolving door is going to allow sodium to go out and build up on the outside and then let potassium come in at the same time as the door revolves and we can build up potassium on the inside. So these pumps. This is not the only way that we can move ions across a membrane, though. This is kind of the first way that we're going to talk about. So first off, I want you to realize, because of this pump, we're going to have more sodium outside and more potassium inside. We're also going to have something called channels. A channel is just like a tunnel going through the cell membrane. So ions can enter and leave through these tunnels. Some of these tunnels are always open and we call them leak channels. So we call them leak channels because these ions are slowly leaking out. We're pumping sodium, out, we're pumping potassium in, but at the same time we have some leak channels and these things are slowly leaking back to where there's less because it wants to go from high to low naturally. Some of these are not leak channels, some of these are called gated channels. Gated channels are usually closed, and if they don't get a specific stimulus, they don't open. But if you do give them that specific stimulus, then they're going to go ahead and open, and they're going to allow ions to move. Now, the real important thing that we've learned in this slide is there's three ways to move ions in and out of a cell. We can use a pump, like a revolving door, sodium out, when potassium comes in and it costs us energy. Or we can use these channels, and these channels don't cost us energy. So these are going to just cause diffusion. So the leak channels are always open, and they're going to allow these ions to move in and out. 
And then the gated channels are only going to allow ions to move when the gate is open, when they get a very specific stimulus. Now, the sodium-potassium pump and the sodium and potassium leak channels, I want you to know, their importance, and we're not really going to talk about them anymore, their importance, the pump and the leak channels for both sodium and potassium are what create transmembrane potential. So again, remember that electrical potential energy across the membrane that we can turn into an action potential, that we can use to be excitable and to conduct. Transmembrane potential comes about due to the pump and due to the leak channels. If we want to make an action potential, then we have to get ions moving in or out through another way and that's through those gated channels. So if we start to allow ions to move through the gated channels, then we can create and we can conduct, we can pass an action potential. And that's where we need to head to. So what we've got so far, we've got these pumps and these leaks that are setting up our ability to be excited and to, and to pass that excitation. But then we have the gated channels that are usually closed and if we can get them to open and get ions to move then we're going to make our stimulation we're going to make our action potential here's the pump again pumps move substances against their gradient so it builds up quantities inside or outside again i want you to know and we can see it here we're going to be moving potassium in as we move sodium out so here we see the potassium Potassium is going to be heading in, and the sodium is going to be heading out. It doesn't look like a revolving door, but in your head, I want you to imagine a revolving door. In order to make it revolve, it causes some ATP, so it's an active process. It requires energy. Here's the channels. The channels, again, we've got leak versus gated. Leak channels are always open. Gated channels are usually closed, and they only open with the proper stimulus. So we're going to talk about the different types of stimulus that can open these channels. And so remember, the leak channels along with the pump set up transmembrane potential. So the leak channels help to set up the transmembrane potential along with the pump, but then the gated channels. Gated channels open when we give them the proper stimulus, and then they can create um, and can then create or conduct an action potential by allowing ions to be in and out of the cell. So again, especially if we get sodium moving in, then we're going to get a stimulation. Okay, so sodium in equals stimulation. Too much potassium out, that's going to equal inhibition. So that's how we can kind of numb something and make it not feel or not act normally. Now, we're going to mainly focus on the stimulation. Again, I mentioned this in the last um, presentation. We're going to mainly focus on the, pre on the stimulation. So here, let's talk about gated channels, and we're going to act like these gates open and allow sodium to move. You know, that's kind of the key. So chemically gated, mechanically gated, and voltage gated. I'm going to hit them real quick, and then we'll see a picture. Chemically gated, its gate is closed, and it opens with a specific chemical. Usually here, we're talking a neurotransmitter. This is how neurotransmitters work overall. So chemically gated channels, when we open them, they have the ability to start our action potentials. The next type that's not really covered very much in our textbook, but you need to be aware of them, is called a mechanically gated channel. Mechanically gated opens with mechanical distortion. In other words, it opens when we push nearby. So if we have a membrane and we can push on part of the membrane, then it's going to kind of wedge this um, gate open and it's going to allow these ions to move and again these guys have the ability to start action potential so overall action potentials tend to start by one of two ways by either chemicals binding or by a physical distortion a pushing nearby the third flavor is called voltage gated voltage gated are going to open when the electricity nearby changes in other words if there's an action potential nearby it's going to stimulate this to open up ahead of it and this will keep the action potential moving so basically what this does is it's going to move the AP down the axon and so again this is mainly involved with conduction not creating the AP but conducting moving the AP down the axon 
Here's our chemically gated channel, usually in response to a neurotransmitter. Here's our neurotransmitter. It binds. The gate's usually closed, but when it binds, it opens. Here we're seeing potassium coming out. We're going to learn here in just a little bit that if potassium comes out, then that's going to trigger a... Um, inhibition. So that's going to kind of not stimulate, but it's going to inhibit that cell. So kind of tell it to not feel anything. Here's the mechanically gated. Here we usually see that it's closed, but if we push nearby, it just kind of props that open. And when it props it open, it allows that sodium to rush in. And now we're starting to actually get more of a sensation. So now we're getting a stimulation. This is usually when we talk about touch, right? So touch, this is also how sound and balance works in your inner ear. So these are not necessarily just for touch. Our body can modify these to make them a lot more advanced, for example, like that sound or that equilibrium. Here's a voltage gated channel. Notice that here we got pluses and minuses. As those pluses and minuses change, it's going to open that gate and that's going to allow those ions to move. I don't want you to worry about this, this closed resting versus closed and active. We're just going to go closed versus open and that's just going to make it simple. Okay. Now, again, we're going to see the, the pumps and the leaks are going to help to set up that resting membrane potential or the transmembrane potential at rest. And then um, we're going to have those gated channels that are going to open. And whenever we get the gated channels open, we're going to be able to move ions. Well, again, we talked about the pumps and the leak channels are setting up specific areas to have higher or lower concentration of these ions. The two main ions we're concerned about is sodium and potassium. Now chloride is, invi is involved too, but we're going to focus more on sodium, which is a plus, and potassium, which is a plus. Well now it starts to get a little confusing. If we're going to put a bunch of sodium outside, well that means we got a bunch of pluses outside. But if we put a bunch of potassium inside, that means we got a whole bunch of pluses inside too. How can the inside be negative? if the outside is positive and they both have all these plus ions. So let's look at that. The inside is more negative because it has other negatively charged stuff. Phosphates, what I want you to know are there's a lot of negatively charged proteins that's inside of the cell. So there's a lot more negatively charged proteins than there are positively charged potassiums. So as a result, the inside of the cell has a negative charge. When we're at rest, the inside of the cell is negative, especially compared to the outside. The outside, we've pumped a lot of that sodium to the outside, just like we pump the potassium to the inside. So we've more sodium outside gives us more of a plus, but we've also got some chloride, which is a minus. But again, it's a balance. There's more positively charged sodium than there is negatively charged chloride. So as a result, the outside of the cell has a positive charge. Now that we've separated charges, we've got a plus on the outside and a minus on the inside. Now we have made transmembrane potential. What we have just created is called an electrochemical gradient. And so uh, that electrochemical gradient, it's an electrical gradient that we're creating because we're separating charges, but we're separating those charges by separating chemicals. So we refer to that as an electrochemical gradient. So this electrical gradient is simply just because we've separated those charges, inside more negative, outside more positive. And now what we've created is called membrane potential, transmembrane potential. So this is how it's actually made. But again, if a cell exhibits this, then it can be excited or it can conduct that excitation. Now, um, I don't really want to focus on this slide. Sorry about that. I thought that I deleted that one. Resting membrane potential. Let's take a look at that. Resting membrane potential is simply just trans brain potential at rest. So when the cell is not doing anything, it's not being stimulated, then what is the actual value or what is happening in that cell? I want us to focus on resting membrane potential as kind of the baseline. This is where everything's going to begin and we're going to have to change the resting membrane potential in order to create a actual potential. So again, resting membrane potential is really just transmembrane potential at rest. It does have a value, and I want you to be aware of that value. That value, again, we're measuring through membrane, so we're actually measuring the inside. 
and we're measuring it at minus 70 millivolts. That sounds like a test question. Minus 70 millivolts. So resting membrane potential, our baseline, we start at minus 70. Now here's the key. If we allow sodium to go in, then that's going to take that minus, and because we're adding pluses to it, because sodium is a plus, then that's going to make our membrane potential go up. If we can make the membrane potential go up, here in just a second, we're going to call that a depolarization. And instead, if we let the potassium channels open and we allow pot potassium to leave, then that's going to lower the negativity on the inside because we're losing positives. And if we go more negative from this baseline, then that's called hyperpolarization. Sodium in is going to cause a depolarization. Here's where we're measuring through this membrane, and we can see that there's a lot more negative proteins than there are the potassiums. And out here we've got a whole lot of sodiums versus our chloride. Now here's what I was just talking about. If we open a channel that allows sodium to come in, so sodium-gated channels open, and sodium comes into the cell because it's a plus, it's now going to take that minus and make it go up, make it go more positive towards the zero, towards positive. So if we're going more positive by adding sodium into the cell, then that is called a depolarization. Depolarizing is a stimulating component. This is the real stimulating component when we get to the actual action potential. This is what causes the real stimulation in an AP is the depolarization. So again, depolarize due to sodium-gated channels. Sodium comes in. We become more positive. If we're on a graph, we're going to go up the hill on the graph. The curve is going to go up. And this is more of a stimulating action. If instead we open potassium-gated channels, we can also open chloride-gated channels. But I want to focus on potassium. If we let too much of the positive out, or if we do gain too negative in, then that's going to make us go from negative to more negative. Okay, It's going to make us go lower. So a hyperpolarization is becoming more negative. And it is due, I want you to focus on the potassium channels opening and potassium leaving the cell. This is going to cause the cell to go more negative. And in the long run, hyperpolarization is going to be more of an inhibiting. Instead of a stimulating, now we're going to block that cell from experiencing something. So we're going to inhibit that cell. So this is the two types of changes we can have from our resting membrane potential. We can either depolarize and become more stimulating, or we can hyperpolarize and become more inhibiting. Now, we're not always just going to do that. So this is not our action potential. These are just the possibilities that we can, we can exhibit as we move away from resting. Now, as we move away from resting, here's some images that, that show depolarization, images showing hyperpolarization. Follow those ions on both of those. Go back and take a look at the other one if you'd like. But here's what we're going to create. If we change resting membrane potential, if we cause either a depolarization or a hyperpolarization in the least little bit, then we call that overall, that's called a graded potential. So changing resting potential is, excuse me, going to create a graded potential. Graded potentials are very temporary and they're local, so they don't spread very far. So if we allow just a little bit of sodium in, then we're only going to affect one little region. We're not going to affect the whole cell. But here's the key. If we disturb that resting membrane potential, we create a graded potential. But the most important thing, if a graded potential is strong enough, if it's enough stimulation, till it reaches a certain point, and we're going to call that point threshold, it's going to be an electrical value, just like our minus 70. But if we can change, if we can get enough sodiums in so that we change it up to maybe minus 60, minus 55, then we hit what's called threshold. And then we're always going to make an action potential. So to determine if we're going to make an AP or not, 
we use graded potentials. So if the graded potential is strong enough, we make an AP. If it's not strong enough, we don't make an AP, and we don't really pay attention to that information. So again, it's a local potential, so that means it doesn't very far, and it's temporary. So this is not our action potential. This is not what we want. It becomes weaker, and it stops with time. So what we need to do is use this to trigger it, the action potential overall. So if a graded potential is strong enough, if there's enough stimulation, if there's enough gated channels over if we have enough neurotransmitters binding to open enough channels, then we're going to raise the transmembrane potential, raise that resting potential to that point called threshold. And again, threshold is just another value. And if we hit threshold, they always create an action potential. Always create an action potential. Okay? And an action potential, it's always the same every single time. So if we make one, then we're doing as good as we can do. So here, the graded potential is really kind of what determines. If it's strong enough, then we're going to hit the threshold, and that's going to cause our action potential. That's going to actually create our true nervous stimulation. So again, that's kind of the guard. Is this important, or is this information not important? If we have enough stimulation, then yes, it is important. Let's hit threshold and make that AP. But if this information is just noise and background stuff that I don't need to pay attention to, well, let's don't make an AP out of this, and let's just move past it. Let's just let it hit as a greater potential. It's going to be local and temporary, and it's not going to cause an AP, and it's just going to be ignored overall. Okay. Now again, once we reach threshold, and this is a minimum voltage value in order to open up these, these gated channels, and then we're going to get that action potential, then um, once the gated, excuse me, once the graded potential reaches threshold, then we're going to create an action potential. And an action potential, as I mentioned, there's really only one type of action potential in the body. So there's one nervous impulse. It's kind of just like this computer that you're using right now. It works on binary, so it works on a bunch of zeros and ones. I'm sure you've heard that before. So zero means there's no stimulation. One means there is stimulation. It's the exact same kind of concept here with the nervous system, how that either we have an actual or we don't. Okay, We can't have two action potentials at the same time. It's not going to matter. That's not going to give us any benefit if we have two at the same time. So an action potential is going to be created when we reach that threshold value. When we reach threshold, I want you to know that sodium channels are going to open, and then we're going to start D polarizing. So the real key to an action potential is that we're going to depolarize cell cause that cell to become stimulated. So once we reach threshold, we open these sodium channels, we allow the sodium to come in, the sodium comes in, it causes the depolarization and the stimulating component of that action potential, and then um, we're going to have to start kind of finishing what we did. So we're going to go up on the graph, but then we need to go back to resting membrane potential because we've already caused that stimulation. And AP is the amount of We've already called that AP. Now back, back to our resting. So then we're going to movement of potassium that's going to help us um, with uh, getting back to resting membrane potential. Let's look at this in some steps, though. We'll look at this in steps here in just a second. Now, what happens to determine um, in our target cell exactly what's going to happen to the target cell? And my slides have stopped moving. Just a second, folks. So, let's see. Here's where we're at. All right. So, here's where we're at. Sorry about that little glitch. Sometimes there's a little pause. The programming. So, here is our action potential. Here's a couple of little notes about an action potential. It's a reversal of polarity. So, it's a polarity is charges. So, we're going to change the the end is going to become more positive, right? It is self-propagated, so we're going to pass it down the axon. It's naturally passed down the axon, self-propagated. We don't have to do anything to make it happen. It's just going to happen. So once the AP is made, and it's usually made at the cell body or the dendrite, then we're simply just going to pass it down the axon. 
like a wire. And again, either we have one or we don't. So it's the all or none law. Either we have an action potential or we don't. If we hit threshold, we're going to make an AP, and it's always the exact same AP. It's never a different one. There's only one type of AP in the body. And so as a result, if we hit threshold, we have an action potential. If not, we don't. So again, this is, I'm not a big gun person at all. You guys know that. But this is kind of uh, similar to what happens with a gun, you know. So the point of uh, pulling a trigger, there's a point where you can put pressure on it and the bullet's not going to come out of the gun, right? But there's a point where you put enough pressure that it fires that bullet and the bullet is going to leave the chamber. So that that point, that pressure point where you pulled and you finally hit that hit that bullet and forced it to leave the barrel, that is threshold. And again, just like an action potential, that bullet is always the same bullet. It's always moving about the same speed. And so we always have the same action potential that's going to be created. Okay, so again, think about it a little bit like that. You pull the trigger. There's a point called threshold where that bullet is released, and then that action potential is moving, and there's nothing we can do to stop it at that point. Okay? Now, let's quickly talk about postsynaptic potentials, and then I really want to get back and focus on action potentials and the stages of an action potential. A postsynaptic potential is what happens to the target cell. Remember, the postsynaptic cell is the cell after the synapse, so this is what I refer to as the target cell. And again, we're going to create graded potentials in the target cell, and we have to determine if there's enough stimulation, what are we going to do? Well, here's the Here's the big issue. A target cell, a postsynaptic cell, many times has more than one neurotransmitter that is affecting it. So many target cells may have three or four, up to 10 to 20, who knows, different neurotransmitters that are affecting it at the exact same time. Some of these neurotransmitters are going to cause depolarization, and some are going to cause hyperpolarization. In the long run, it is a combination, it's a balance of all of these that truly determines what the, the target cell is going to do. In other words, if we've got more stimulating neurotransmitters, more neurotransmitters cause depolarization than compared to the inhibitory neurotransmitters, then our target cell is going to be stimulated. But if we've got more inhibitory neurotransmitters causing hyperpolarization in that target cell, in that postsynaptic cell, compared to depolarization, then overall we are going to inhibit that target cell. So when we look at these postsynaptic potentials, we're going to talk about two different types, excitatory versus inhibitory. And so each of these neurotransmitters has the capacity to cause an excitatory or an inhibitory um, postsynaptic potential. And so this determines overall what that neuron does. And as I mentioned, more excitatory versus inhibitory, a target's going to be stimulated, excited. If there's more inhibitory versus excitatory, then the target is inhibited. I don't want you to know all these details about what we're about to talk about, these steps, but I do want you to know some basics. First off, um, Again, these are based on the neurotransmitters. We've already hit this information, so you can take a look at it, but this is what I just, just um, talked about just a second ago. Here's where I want to go. Excitatory postsynaptic potential. There's two different types of postsynaptic potentials. There's an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential, and then there's an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. I want you to understand that each neurotransmitter, when it binds, it causes one of these. It either causes an EPSP, either it causes that cell to become excited by depolarizing that cell, or it binds and it causes that cell to become inhibited by binding, by uh, allowing that uh, hyperpolarization um, dealing with potassium coming out of the cell. So the EPSP, I want you to know the excitatory postsynaptic potential. It comes about um, whenever an excitatory neurotransmitter binds. And again, I want you to know that it allows sodium in, and that's what causes the excitation. I don't want you to know those steps. And then we have an IPSP. IPSPs are inhibitory 
postsynaptic potentials. Inhibitory postsynaptic potentials happen when an inhibitory neurotransmitter binds to that postsynaptic cell, and there it's going to cause those potassium channels to open, and as potassium leaves, that makes the cell become more negative, and that's going to hyperpolarize or inhibit that cell. Again, it's a balance of these two. It's a balance of the excitatory and the inhibitory that are going to determine exactly what that cell does. There are both excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters that are simultaneously released from different neurons. They're binding on that target cell, and so the balance is what determines what that cell is going to end up doing, the balance between the EPSPs and the IPSPs. Here's an example. I love this image right here. This is an incredible, look at this, 80,000 times what you would normally see. Here is a target cell, and here are all these, look at that, that really looks like a knob on a drawer, for example. So there is your synaptic knob, and we're seeing all these axons coming on. So right here we're seeing this postsynaptic cell is being stimulated by tons, hundreds of these different neurons, and each one is going to be releasing a different neurotransmitter based on what it does where it's coming from. And so here we can see the reds are the IPSPs, the greens are the EPSPs. If we counted all these up, we could balance it out, whichever we've got more of, that's what our target cell is going to do. Okay, so this is part of that um, postsynaptic potential. Now, I want you to understand that once we reach that threshold, then we're always going to fire that action potential. Okay, in order to get to that threshold, we have to sum a little bit our graded potentials. They keep kind of zapping, and if these graded potentials are strong enough, they kind of bump up even further each time that we get a little graded potential. We kind of see that here, potential one, potential two, potential three. So here we're starting to see if there's enough stimulation, and we're getting enough of these graded potentials to add up. So if the graded potential is strong enough, then we can reach this point called threshold. Again, threshold is just a value, somewhere around minus 55. And um, I would like for you to know that minus 55 is threshold value. Then we're going to cause our depolarization followed by our hyperpolar. Well, excuse me, followed by repolarization, coming back to resting. And so that's what's really going to cause that action potential, is if we get enough stimulation overall at that target cell. Again, this is an all or none principle. Either we create an action potential or we don't, and whenever we create that action potential, it is always the same action potential. Um, it can only do one thing, and so once we've got that one, we don't need another one. There is no such thing as a two, because our system only runs on zeros and ones. So once we have a one, we can't have any more than a one. We've got our stimulation, so we're good to go. So if threshold is reached, then we're going to make that AP. If it's not, we are not going to make the AP. And once we do, here's, here's that analogy similar to a gun. Once we get enough pressure on the trigger, the gun is fired. If we don't have enough pressure, it's not fired. And that bullet's always the same bullet, always traveling at the same kind of speed. Okay, so same thing AP. It's always there. Oh, no. This is not good. This is terrible. This is not what I wanted to see. Um, here is the image that I really wanted to rely on to teach you guys the action potential um, and its stages. Let me see if I can find this somewhere else. Oh, no, it's been deleted somewhere else. Okay, I want you all to go find this picture because this is a super-duper important picture, and I apologize. I don't know how I can get this to show up. Um because it's not showing me the image that I want right here. My screen is just black. Maybe yours is not. I want you to realize that we've got different stages of the action potential, and it's better seen here in an image. We start out, and we are at resting membrane potential. So step one, I'm just going to follow through with the steps, and then you can open it up and take a look in your textbook. So please take a look in your textbook. Find this figure. I think it's still figure 12.19 there in chapter 12. This is a very important figure that you need to be familiar with, and you guys are visual learners, so go ahead and hit pause, go find that picture, pull it up, and then go ahead and unpause it, and I'll go ahead and start again, okay? So that'll give you enough time right there. Now, let's 
start with step one. Step one, we are basically, and again, I can't see my image, so I can't point it out. I'm just going to have to verbally walk you through it. Step one, we're at resting membrane to potential. So step one, resting membrane potential, we're just chilling, right? We're at minus 70 millivolts. So if we're looking at this picture, we should be down here, minus 70, a nice flat line. Eventually, we're going to start to get stimulation. So in step two, the beginning of step two is stimulation creates greater potential. We're going to see that summation a little bit. We'll see that bouncing, kind of moving up. And if we have a strong enough stimulation, then it's going to reach our threshold point. And we should have a dotted line somewhere around here in our picture. And so somewhere around that step three, we're going to hit that dotted line as we with our graded potentials, and that is our threshold point. After step three, we hit threshold. I want you to call step three rapid depolarization. So step two, we can say graded potential to threshold. And once we hit threshold, then step three is a rapid depolarization. If we've got this image, you can see that now we're going to go up that hill super quickly. And so it's showing us that we have opened some fast sodium channels. And I want you to know that, that we've opened sodium channels, especially fast sodium channels, allows that sodium to move quickly. And now we're creating our actual action potential, the depolarization. This major depolarization here is the true state. Eventually, though, after we've stimulated, we need to relax in order so that we can re-stimulate, for example. And so the relaxation phase is called repolarization. Repolarization coming down the hill between step four and five, a gradual downhill. Repolarization is where we are relaxing. I want you to always connect that. Repolarize, relax, also one more RE. I want you to connect resting membrane potential. That's where we're going to. So when we're repolarizing, we're relaxing, and we're heading back to resting membrane potential back to our baseline. This is going to be due to some potassium channels opening and potassium moving out of the cell. And the sodium is going to be moving as well. What we're really doing here, we're allowing the potassium to leave, but we're also resetting. We're also putting all the ions back in their original location from where we moved them to begin with. One of the problems with repolarization, though, is that we overshoot resting. So we overshoot resting membrane potential by a little bit. So in step five, we should see a little dip below 70 before we come back up to step six to our resting. In step five, because we go below our resting membrane potential, that is a hyperpolarization. So there is a brief hyperpolarization period that takes place, and so that kind of inhibits during this AP, another AP can't be created. When we're firing one bullet, we can't fire two at the same time. We can only fire one because we've only got one chamber. So same kind of concept here. This hyperpolarization is inhibiting a little bit. It's allowing the cell to do its thing and then come back to relaxation before it can zap again. So that means we can't sum these nervous impulses. Once we have one AP, it has to go away before we can get another AP. Okay, so hyperpolarization then leads us back to resting membrane potential. So in step six, we should be back to our resting membrane potential. So don't forget those steps. This is very important. Step one, step six are both resting membrane potential before and after. So the real main steps are two through five. Two, we have stimulation. Um, that leads to graded potentials. The graded potentials reach threshold. And then in three, we have rapid depolarization due to those fast sodium channels. We're going to um, allow sodium in, and so that's going to make us go up the graph real fast. And in that process of moving up the graph, that is our stimulating component of the action potential. After we stimulate, we need to relax and bring it back down to resting. And so that's called repolarization. And we overshoot resting just a slight bit, and we call that hyperpolarization before we get back to step six, which is our, our resting membrane potential. Now, again, this is just very basic, and it just looks like a hump on a picture, but this is what causes 
all of the electrical activity. This is all the electrical activity in your nervous system. And these are what cause changes at the effectors, what actually change things in the body. Pretty amazing. So again, depolarization, we're going to get more positive. So that's going to be due to rapid entry of sodium coming in. We may go all the way up to a plus 30 from our minus 7. But the whole key, that depolarization is the stimulating component. Um, then we're going to start to, I'm not going to be concerned about any of these slides that I'm skipping over. Then we're going to start to repolarize. Repolarizing is always return to resting. We're, we are relaxing, we're resting, we're repolarizing, we're returning to our baseline. And so there at the end, we're going to be back at our minus 70. But remember, it overshoots it just slightly, and so it causes a little bit of hyperpolarization. So the hyperpolarization, very close to the end, we're going to briefly have this hyperpolarization period um, before the sodium potassium pumps kick back in and they fix that resting membrane potential and bring it back into balance. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to inhibit, just like we did with the muscle a little bit, we're going to inhibit, <coughs> excuse me about that, um, Oh, we're going to inhibit while we've got one action potential undergoing. We can't make another one happen. And this is called the refractory period. The refractory period is always where we inhibit something in happening because we're already doing it. So right now, I don't want you to worry about absolute versus relative refractory period. The facts are, if it's a refractory period, we cannot create another action potential during a refractory period. Okay, I don't think it's going to be on the test, but absolute means there's no way, no stimulus to make an AP, but relative means that a really strong stimulus might possibly be able to do that. I want you to focus that refractory is simply just a time frame when we can't stimulate another AP, so this forces the action potential to finish before we can start another one. Again, it's a series of ones and zeros. It's not necessarily two threes. We can't double them up, right? So we have to finish one before we can start another one. Okay, so that's kind of the way to think about it. Again, there's that image in mine. It's blacked out, unfortunately. It was the same one that we learned those steps on. Hopefully, you've looked at that in your textbook. It makes good sense. Now, once we get to the synaptic knob, here's something that we did not talk about whenever it came to the muscular system. We kind of focused on um, the calcium in the muscles being involved with troponin tropomyelin because I didn't want to confuse you as to um, where calcium is used elsewhere. So here in the nervous system at the synaptic knob, I want you to understand that during synaptic activity, when the action potential reaches the synaptic knob, in muscles, I told you that at that point, we're going to release the neurotransmitter. So I made it real simple. P at synaptic knob equals neurotransmitter release. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. So I want you to learn this extra little step now and kind of fold it into your knowledge. First off, when the AP reaches the synaptic knob, the action potential, I want you to know, opens calcium channels. These are voltage gated. That's not too important, but they open due to the AP arriving. So that means that they're voltage gated. But now they're going to allow calcium ions to move into the synaptic knob. When that calcium ion moves into the synaptic knob, it's going to bind to the vesicle and it's going to kind of weight it down. It's going to make it heavy. And when it makes it heavy, the binding of the calcium to these vesicles pulls the vesicle closer to the outside of the synaptic knob. And eventually it forces the vesicle to release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. So we're adding a little set of steps here. AP at synaptic knob. Next step, calcium channels open. Allow calcium in. Third step, calcium binds to synaptic vesicles. Fourth step, calcium bound to synaptic vesicles makes vesicle want to release to the outside. And step five, vesicle releases neurotransmitter into synaptic cleft. 
Okay, so we're just kind of adding a little bit of an extra step here. We can see that AP comes down, causes these calcium channels to open, calcium comes in, binds to the vesicle, and I like to think that it kind of weights it down. It makes it heavy, forces it towards the surface of that synaptic knob, and there it releases those little diamond, red diamond-shaped neurotransmitters into our actual synaptic cleft. Again, over here, the target is going to be some of those chemically gated channels, so we can start a new AP in our target cell. Now, I don't want to cover this in too much detail, but I want to make sure that we cover this very quickly. We're almost to the end of this presentation. I know it's taken a while to get through these, and these are not easy, folks. Um, I really wish that we could have taught this in the class so I can be face-to-face -face with you to answer any questions that you have. But don't forget, look through these presentations. Be ready to answer questions for our Blackboard Collaborate session during our normal class time because that's what we're going to focus on during class. I'm going to get you to watch these recordings outside of class as much as you want so you feel comfortable with it and then show up for class and we're going to discuss any issues that you might have with these. So one of our last topics, velocity of a nerve signal. I talked about this with myelin, right? How myelin can speed up that action potential. So we know that one of the factors that speed up an AP is myelination or the presence or absence of myelin on the axon. The other thing, I'm not going to talk about this very much, I'm just going to mention it real quick. The diameter, how big around is the axon? Think about this just like you think about your power cords, right? A small power cord can only move so much power. It can only move so much electricity so fast. But those giant power cords that's up on those giant iron men, those big metal structures that hold our power lines, those are some big old power lines and they're carrying a whole lot more energy and they're carrying it a whole lot faster. So if you have a bigger axon, then we can carry more electricity and we can carry it faster overall. What we're going to focus on here though is the myelin, with or without myelin. What we're talking about propagation means movement of the action potential. So the word propagation or conduction just means movement of the AP down the axon. We have two different flavors, two different varieties of propagation or conduction. The first is called continuous. Continuous takes place on unmyelinated axons. Axons that do not have myelin on them, that's where our continuous conduction is going to take place. The continuous conduction means that it must be passed down every single little part of the axon. It hits every continuous part of that axon, right? Compare that to saltatory. Saltatory is a term that I learned back in animal behavior. Um, in animal behavior, I learned that frogs and rabbits and kangaroos move by saltatory movement. So if you haven't figured it out yet, saltatory means jumping, right? So saltatory conduction is what happens when we have myelinated axons. Again, we're going to see it jump from node to node. That's the key. This AP jumps from node to node. And in that process of jumping from node to node, it speeds up the action potential. Okay, It jumps over the myelinated regions, and it lands on the neurofibril node, or just the node. This is going to increase that myelinated speed up. So the speed of the AP on a myelinated axon is, is much faster due to this myelination. It's also more efficient because we don't have to actually stimulate those pumps except for in certain places. Okay, so here we're kind of seeing how it can bounce from node to node. Here we're seeing this depolarization of this one, and then it's going to bounce over to, to the next one. Now to finish this up, let's talk about neurotransmitters. I didn't really talk about neuromodulators. I'll mention them, but um, I want to focus on neurotransmitters only. Remember neurotransmitters, these guys are chemicals that are going to be released into a synapse, and they're going to cause um, an action potential on a target cell. They're going to stimulate or inhibit that target cell, that postsynaptic cell. Neurotransmitters, I've already talked about how most of these are types of proteins. We mentioned that they're made with those chromatophilic substances, that they're made with those nissel bodies and those ribosomes in the cell body. And so um, it's actually, um, most of these are going to be types of proteins. And again, that's the reason that we can't allow the blood to touch some of these neurons is because the proteins that are normally in our blood, these amino acids can act as neurotransmitters, right? I mentioned that with some of these um, sugar substitutes and a lot of these diet sodas, how they're causing a lot of neurological disorders because things like aspartate, glutamate, are actually, or glutamic acid, aspartic acid, those are actually um, amino acids. And so if those get across the blood-brain barrier, then they start to make 
make your neurons go haywire. And there's been a lot of recorded incidences, a lot of research that shows how these these sodas with these um, bad sugar substances, um, sugar substitutes, are really bad for your nervous system. I know my mother-in-law had to go to the hospital because she was drinking too much Diet Pepsi at one point, and she was having some seizure issues. She quit Diet Pepsi. And all the seizures went away. She had no more neurological disorders. So definitely kind of crazy. Again, there's a whole lot of these. So a lot of these neurotransmitters we also use as hormones, and they may be used as local factors. Again, it just depends. If we're releasing it into a synapse, it's called a neurotransmitter. If we release it into the bloodstream, it's called a hormone. If we release it within the same tissue and use it, then we call it a local factor. So, it, you know, you're going to see a repeat from some of the stuff that we may have already seen. Don't forget that the number one neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So acetylcholine, ACH, this is the one that we talked about in the um, skeletal muscular system. And so this this joker is 80% of the synapses in the body are going to use this. Depending on where we use it, it can have both an excitatory and an inhibitory effect. In our muscles, it excites our muscles. It forces the muscles to contract, to move. But in, for example, our peripheral nervous system, if we see acetylcholine used, especially in our autonomic nervous system, that's going to do more inhibition to the body. That's going to kind of calm the body down, make, it want to sit, make you want to sit down and just kind of rest and relax. So acetylcholine, it's a little bit of both. It all depends on where it's used, and it's used in a lot of places. And again, it's 80% of the synapses, and we know that we used it in our neuromuscular junction because that's what we talked about in Chapter 10. Um, amino acids, as I mentioned, glutamate or aspartate. So these are what's being used as our sugar substitutes. These guys act as neurotransmitters, and these can change the way that your brain works, and this is not a good thing to overload your body with those bad chemicals. Monoamines. Again, amine, talking about amino acids. So here what we're going to do is we're going to take an amino acid and we're going to modify it. So we're just going to derive from these amino acids. Who cares that the carboxyl group, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that, is removed. The whole key is that we're just going to modify an amino acid. When we modify it, we're going to make one of the biggest groups of neurotransmitters that I want you to know, which are the catecholamines. And this, again, is a group that we talked about with um, hormones. So the catecholamines are the same thing as our epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is our adrenals. And so remember we talked about this, how um, the catecholamines were one of our amino acid-based um, hormone groups along with that tyrosine making the thyroid hormone way back in that chapter 17. I know it's been a while, y'all. Um, so, but also this catecholamine, I want you to make sure that you add dopamine into that group because dopamine is a very important type of a neurotransmitter. So dopamine, um, we have learned, you know, we've used a kind of a, a negative situation, not necessarily negative, it was its intent, but we've used kind of a negative situation to understand how we can manipulate drugs to manipulate the nervous system. Dopamine is used um, in, uh, for example, cocaine. Cocaine blocks the ability of your neurons to reuptake, to take the neurotransmitter back into the synaptic knob so it's not active in the cleft. And so cocaine blocks the reuptake mechanisms. And so it leaves dopamine in your synapses longer. And that's what creates the effects of that drug. Now, originally, if you don't know this, cocaine was intended to be used as a medicine on a battlefield to knock a patient to a point where they could undergo traumatic amputations in the middle of a battlefield. You're in the middle of a battle. Your leg has sustained enough injury that it must be amputated. They were using cocaine in the early 1900s in order to do that on the battlefield. So this was not intended as some sort of drug to be taken by the public. This was intended for extremely harsh situations. And so leaving that dopamine in the synapses creates that effect of the cocaine. 
But what this gave us the ability to do, we started to study this and we learned from this, and now we can take that and we can use this against other neurotransmitters. And this can be a positive thing so that, for example, with serotonin, if you don't have enough serotonin in your synapses, then you feel depressed. And so what most many antidepressants are going to do is block the reuptake of serotonin. We didn't have these things up until the 70s, practically, these antidepressants. And so it took a long time for us to understand how we could block a reuptake, leave the neurotransmitter in the synapse, and it causes overstimulation, and that overstimulation can actually be medicine for us. And so now we've used this, this dopamine and the model that cocaine uses to actually make a lot of our neurological medicines and um, to control mood or control anxiety or things like that. So very cool um, that we use that in order um, to get a lot more gain than we could have. Uh, neuropeptides, some of these small chains of amino acids, these guys are also considered to be some of our neurotransmitters. So these are the different groups, different classes. Here's a nice image that's pointing out a lot of these. Here's acetylcholine, here's our amino acids, so several of these are listed. One that I want to mention again that we don't, I didn't talk about is this one right here, GABA. Gamma amino butyric acid. That's how it gets the acronym GABA. So GABA we don't fully understand but we do know that GABA levels in the brain synapses have something to do with anxiety. So again if we can control how much GABA is located in our in our CNS synapses then that can actually help to control some of the anxiety that we start to see more and more prevalent in our society. Here's the monoamines. We've even got some histamine. There's our serotonin, right? So our serotonin, again, this is um, important for mood. This helps with mood. Um, Let's we'll try to zoom in. There we go. So when we look at this, we can see serotonin, various functions, but again, we're talking a lot about with mood, and this is our, what our antidepressants are going to modify is going to be serotonin. And again, your mood has a lot to do with how you sleep and your appetite and the way that you're thinking, right? And so serotonin can help with a lot of different things. There's those catecholamines. Again, um, dopamine is in the brain, so it's involved with learning and behavior and mood as well. And so we can see the erratic um, responses of somebody, for example, that's using cocaine. And if you've ever seen images or anything like that, to understand that this can affect some of the same things serotonin can affect as well. When we look at some of the neuropeptides, so here are some of these neuropeptides. We've just got groups of amino acids linked together. I want you to know about substance P. Substance P is the one involved with pain. So this is a pain neurotransmitter. Um, I want you to be aware that opioids, our body makes natural opiates, um, but now you know our society is in the middle of this opiate crisis. Um, so opioids block substance P. They modulate, they change what this neurotransmitter does. That's what a neuromodulator does is it modifies. It modulates what the transmitter does. And so the opioids modify substance P so it doesn't bind quite as much so we don't experience quite as much pain, okay? Beta endorphins, I want to mention the endorphins real quick. The endorphins are our base natural morphine. So for example, beta endorphins, whenever you start to hurt your body by exercising too much, for example, this is how you make an endorphin junkie, if you've ever heard of that term. So these endorphins, these actually help prevent that pain. So these are types of neuromodulators too, to be honest with you. And so these endorphins, your body, um, the female body releases something similar to this during labor and delivery called enkephalins, and the enkephalins and the endorphins are both pain relievers. And so mama, um, during natural childbirth, releases a pain relief um, neurotransmitter, but um, my wife said it didn't work. So she um, had our daughter naturally and uh, without any epidural or any medicine, she said that, yeah, that the uh, enkephalins didn't work for her. So, <laughs> all right. Um, removal of the neurotransmitter. Here's what I've talked about. So removal of that neurotransmitter from the synapse, 
we're going to use what's called a reuptake mechanism. So we're going to reuptake this um, in, back into the uh, synaptic knob so that it can be recycled and reused. We're just going to break it. A lot of times we can break it apart. Sometimes it's not um, broken apart at all. So I want us to focus on the rake. So um, sometimes it's broken down in the synapse so it can be degraded um, and then recycled. But a lot of times I want us to focus on this reuptake. So it's just recycled. It's going to be sucked back up, kind of like a vacuum cleaner, back into the synaptic knob. And then that's going to be able to reuse that um, neurotransmitter for the next um, time that it's needed. Now, after this, there is a little bit about neuromodulators. And neuromodulators, these guys are chemicals that can change what a neurotransmitter does. So either it can help it, it can allow it to do something new, or it can go against it. So usually we've either got more of a um, a symbiotic relationship where they work together, they facilitate, or we tend to have more of an antagonistic relationship where they can inhibit, they can change things. So I mentioned how, for example, opiates and substance P can modify each, uh, you know, the opiates can modify the pain. And so there's an example of a neuromodulator. So I don't know if that's going to show up on the test, but that is the end of this presentation. I know this has been a long one, and this is not the easiest information. I get it, guys. Um, I really wish that we could be in class so I could teach you guys this stuff face-to-face. -face. I miss y'all, but also just, you know, this is hard stuff. I'd rather be right there for you to give you direct answers. Um, make sure that you're rolling through these presentations multiple times. Look at these. Take notes. Make sure that uh, when in doubt, look at it again. And then um, whenever we get together during our normal class times on Blackboard, collaborate, we're just going to focus on hitting the high notes. I'm going to hit the high notes. I'm going to make sure that you've got the important information that you need for the test. Um, and then we're going to roll with that. Okay, so I hope that you guys are doing well, and I hope this hasn't been too overwhelming. I understand that it has for me, because <laughs> this is not how I like to do it. So I understand how it could be overwhelming for you. So give yourself time. I'm trying to post these early so that you have plenty of time to look over um, these two uh, Chapter 12 um, uh, presentations before our class on Tuesday. So make sure that you go ahead and you look at these. Get some notes. Write your notes down. I'm going to put those detailed notes and, and outlines up online. But go ahead and be proactive and get your information starting. Get a packet of information ready to prepare for the test with your study questions and your notes. And then um, make sure that you, if you have any questions that you've prepared them for our collaborate session. All right. Love you guys. Mean it. See you later.